Harriet Tubman is one of the most important figures in American history. Best known for her role as conductor on the Underground Railroad, she led 13 daring missions to rescue enslaved people, never losing a single passenger, paving the way to become known as the Moses of her people. But a closer look at Harriet Tubman reveals an astonishing person whose life journey didn't end at emancipation. She was someone who cared for others till her dying day, always putting their needs first. Today we look a little closer at this amazing woman in a segment we like to call Five Curious Things You May Not Have Known About Harriet Tubman. When the Civil War started in the spring of 1861, Harriet Tubman put aside her fight against slavery to conduct combat as a soldier and spy for the United States Army. She offered her services to Massachusetts Governor John Andrew, who was known for his campaign to form the all-black 54th and 55th regiments. Governor Andrew admired Tubman and thought she would be a great intelligence asset for the Union forces, so he arranged for her to go to South Carolina to work with Army officers in charge of the recently captured Hilton Head District. There she provided nursing care to soldiers and hundreds of newly liberated people who crowded Union camps. Tubman's skill curing soldiers stricken by a variety of diseases became legendary. But it was her military service of spying and scouting behind Confederate lines that earned her the highest praise. She recruited eight men and together they infiltrated enemy territory. Tubman made contact with local enslaved people who secretly shared their knowledge of Confederate movements and plans. Wary of white Union soldiers, many local African Americans trusted and respected Tubman. According to George Garrison, a second lieutenant with the 55th Massachusetts, Tubman secured more intelligence from them than anybody else. In early June 1863, Harriet became the first woman in U.S. history to command an armed military raid, when she guided Colonel James Montgomery and his 2nd South Carolina Colored Volunteers Regiment along the Combahee River. While there, they routed Confederate outposts, destroyed stores of cotton, food, and weapons, and liberated over 750 enslaved people. The Union victory was widely celebrated. Newspapers from Boston to Wisconsin reported on the river assault by Montgomery, and his black regiment, noting Tubman's important role as the black she Moses who led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted. Ten days after the successful attack, radical abolitionist and soldier Francis Jackson Merriman witnessed Major General David Hunter, commander of the Hilton Head District, go and fetch a pitcher of water and stand waiting with it in his hands while a black woman drank as if he had been one of his own servants. In that letter to Governor Andrew, Merriman added, that woman was Harriet Tubman. When Harriet was a young girl, she was sent to a dry goods store on an errand and encountered a fugitive slave who had left his plantation without permission. When Harriet's overseer demanded she help restrain him, a defiant Tubman refused. The overseer then picked up a two-pound weight from the counter and threw it at the fugitive, but it fell short and struck Harriet on the head. Harriet was not offered medical attention, but was instead sent back to work. Since that incident, Harriet was prone to falling into deep slumber at any time. Then she would awaken and continue her conversation or work. This behavior is a major symptom of narcolepsy. With narcolepsy comes vivid dreams and hallucinations that could last for hours. Harriet believed that her visions instructed the best route to freedom. Scientifically termed hypnagogic hallucinations, these visions occur when a person enters REM sleep quickly after falling asleep. Historians think Harriet's head injury may have been the catalyst that caused her to escape slavery 
and lead others to freedom. Being viewed as a sickly person and thus an inadequate slave was a dangerous scenario for enslaved persons who would have been routinely beaten for their lack of output. With her new sleeping disorder, Harriet could no longer keep up with the tasks at hand. Escape was her only option. Despite visible scars from lashings that stayed on her body for a lifetime, the blow to her head may have been Harriet's most enduring affliction, possibly even fueling her faith. Harriet's mother told her Bible stories in her youth, and Tubman remained a devout Christian. After the incident, she began reporting her vivid dreams and powerful visions that she believed were revelations and premonitions from God, urging her to follow his teachings and do his will by freeing the enslaved. Harriet Tubman believed in the equality of all people, black or white, male or female, which made her sympathetic to the women's rights movement and a strong supporter of women's voting rights, giving speeches on women's suffrage in New York, Boston, and Washington, D.C. Now, although her role was more of a strong supporter than a leader, Harriet soon became a voice for black women in America. As a woman who had fought for her own freedom and the freedom of others, Tubman set to work by touring and giving speeches about her own experiences as a female slave and as the liberator of hundreds born under the bondage of slavery. Harriet participated in suffrage conventions organized by both black and white women, and she supported the National Women's Suffrage Association of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Her membership reflected a close friendship with Susan B. Anthony and her own aspirations for suffrage. In 1896, when she was already frail, Harriet was invited as a guest speaker at the first meeting of the National Association of Colored Women. Despite being illiterate, Harriet's speeches were popular and always left people wanting more. In one of those speeches, Harriet famously said, every great dream begins with a dreamer. Always remember, you have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to reach for the stars to change the world. At the age of 74, Tubman purchased at auction a 25-acre parcel of land with several structures adjacent to her own seven-acre farm. Her hope was to establish the Tubman Home for the Aged and Indigent Negroes, caring for the old and poor in her community. As her body slowed down, Tubman wanted to make sure her caretaking work would last beyond her own lifetime. When she was unable to raise funds necessary to open the facility, Tubman deeded the property to the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church in exchange for their opening and operating the home. Located in Auburn, New York, the Tubman Home formally opened in 1908. She created a place for former slaves to receive housing and health care that would enable them to age in dignity and decency. The facility operated until the early 1920s. Tubman herself became a patient, staying in a structure on the property called John Brown Hall, which was used as the infirmary and main dormitory until her death in 1913. After it closed, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church held on to the property, but the buildings fell into disrepair. In 1953, the AME Zion Church rebuilt one structure and opened it to the public as a museum, preserving the humanitarian vision of its founder. The property became part of Harriet Tubman National Historic Park, a partnership between the National Park Service and the Harriet Tubman Home. In what is considered among the first nursing homes for Blacks, Tubman cemented her steadfast conviction that health care is a universal human right and a foundational block of upward mobility in America. 
Harriet Tubman will soon be the face on the $20 bill, which is scheduled to debut in the year 2030. Originally scheduled for 2020 to honor the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, the creation and circulation of the currency has had its setbacks. The process is more difficult than may be initially perceived by the public, as new currency has to be outfitted with world-class anti-counterfeit traits. Additionally, the American Council of the Blind successfully sued the Treasury Department in 2002, demanding that the department includes a tactile signifier, similar to Braille, for the blind and visually impaired. A federal judge agreed, and the decision was made to include such an element in the next revision of the U.S. currency. Tubman's descendants have spoken about their disappointment, expressing their worry that three members of the family who are in their 90s will not live to see Tubman honored on the U.S. currency. Nonetheless, they have the support of many people inside and outside of politics and remain hopeful that the issue will continue to garner the support needed to expedite the process and honor one of America's great heroes. And there you have five curious things you may not have known about Harriet Tubman. If you have any historical figures you'd like to add to these episodes, let us know in the comments. And thanks for watching, folks. We'll see you next time on Five Curious Things. Take care.